Thank you so much, uh, Father Clifford. It's really an honor to be speaking to all of you today. Uh, I'd like to point out two things before I actually start uh, on the topic and the issues. One is that I would have really liked to have visited Barbados earlier this year and have a chance to hug you and be close to you and listen to your stories and maybe share a dinner or a lunch with you. But of course, 2020 would have none of that. And the other thing I want to point out is that the powers that be at the intimate uh, conviction conferences, you know, the big bosses, uh, for some reason decided that I would be speaking to you today on my 10th wedding anniversary. It was 10 years ago that Eduardo and I went uh, before Mexico City Court to get married uh, to the date, November 25th. So that gives me plenty of opportunity to tell you about that story a little bit. I do want to uh, point out before we go to that, that I had to speak from the framework of countries that are former Spanish or Portuguese colonies. Uh, I have to say that I have never been to an English speaking country in the Americas. Belize is right across my Mexican border and I have never been. I have been in the Caribbean to Cuba and to the Dominican Republic, but never to the Eastern Caribbean. Uh, so my bad, I hope that changes soon. Barbados was supposed to change that, but it did not happen. So I'm saying that because uh, I believe that in this larger part of, of uh, Latin America, uh, people who speak Spanish and Portuguese, the real legal issue are uh, the, the equal marriage uh, legislation. Uh, I think uh, that is where we're headed. I think each country is moving in that direction. And uh, some of us have done it differently. Some of us have done it through the courts. Others have erased a few words in the constitution and that was that. Uh, so I think it's really important that we know that the case of Mexico, and I think I can speak also about Colombia and countries like Chile and Argentina, we are well known for having these amazing legislations, right? We have beautiful laws, laws on the books. We have regulations that are there uh, that are very progressive, that are, you know, first world, as we would like to say. The problem I see is that enforcement is not that amazing. We have a problem of poor enforcement and that makes the laws valueless. You know, that it's worthless to have them beautifully written out. Uh, but anyway, I, I am the last one to speak today. Uh, we're not uh, in person in Barbados, so I thought I would uh, save you from the constitutional law uh, download and just move to telling you about uh, my wedding 10 years ago and getting married in Mexico. And hopefully, I agree with Jim totally that speaking about the whole countries of Latin America in one talk is a bit of a challenge. So I'll focus on Mexico, my country. I am in Puerto Vallarta, one of the most uh, uh, gay free cities, uh, gay acceptable LGBTQ communities in Mexico after Mexico City. And we are on the Pacific coast, just, just so you guys know. Uh, all right, now we could go to, the, to that first photo, uh, Nick. Uh, I, I wanna point out that going before a judge and getting married uh, is often an act of courage. I want to point out that it's no use to have these beautiful laws there in the books if we don't have the courage to go out and make good on those rights and use those rights. And I'm saying that we can go to photo number two if you want. Uh, I'm telling you that because I talk to, to LGBTQ people here in Mexico, in Latin America, and I see this lingering uh, reluctance and fear of going before the institutions and doing good uh, on our rights, on getting married uh, on the countries that that can be done, on getting social security services, on getting police protection because we are LGBTQ. There's a bunch of regulations and laws there that we need to have the courage and the wisdom and the ability to actually make good on. So I want to point that out because uh, I hear stories of couples who have uh, one of them be in an accident and ending up in an emergency room or in an ICU and having their nephews or their uh, nieces having more of a right to visit them. Yeah, if you want, we can move on, on to the next photo. Um, that is what a marriage license in Mexico looks like. So uh, do believe me that we got married and we signed a bunch of papers to, to do this. 
uh, but I'm, I'm showing them to you because I do think uh, they provide a tool uh, to improve our lives. And if they're on the books, if you're in a country where that is allowed, uh, I don't go around <laughs> promoting marriage of any kind. Uh, you and I know that there's one or two marriages that should have never happened. I'm sure we all know that. Uh, what I'm saying is that if you want to be protected by the law and you have a stable uh, same-sex relationship, relationship, it makes sense uh, to go to the institutions and make good on those rights. Uh, it's funny, I, I want to tell you a, a story about uh, how it was that I got married, actually, because Mexico as a country, as a city, Mexico City, the capital, approved civil unions uh, some three years before they approved uh, uh, LGBTQ marriage, same-sex marriage, equal marriage. Uh, so I was a U.S. government employee at the time, and uh, my work was administered by the U.S. Embassy in Mexico City. So of course, I had to go to these beautiful uh, security background checks and interview. So I go to the interview, and it took the official only a few minutes to realize not only that I was gay, but that I had a partner and I had been living with him for at least 10 years. I wanna point out that by the time Eduardo and I went to, before the judge to get married, we had been together and living in the same household for a whole 14 years already. So you can do the simple math on that. Uh, but I'm, I'm having this conversation with a security official and he looks at me and says, Carlos, I want you to know that the US government and the uh, US embassy in Mexico City itself has these new regulations by which same-sex partners are given uh, privileges as if you were married. At that time, I insist, it was only civil unions in Mexico City. So the story ends that two and a half or three years pass, uh, the Mexico City equal marriage law is passed, I get married and I go back to human resources at the US embassy and tell the lady who had my file, uh, guess what, I got married. So she looks at me, uh, it is these, these views uh, of a few seconds that we get from heterosexuals and that seem to last like three or four hours. And I'm like, what is she gonna say? So she said two things. One was, Carlos, you're the first person at this embassy in Mexico City that comes to tell me this, but I assume everything will be the same as it is for the paperwork, everything will work just the same as for everyone else. That was a relief. And then what she said was, I wish you had told me a little beforehand that this was gonna happen because the US government actually gives you a two week vacation, paid vacation when you're getting married uh, to keep prepare for your marriage and to go honeymooning. So uh, again, using the rights on time makes sense. And that vacation was lost because I was a bit reluctant to uh, speak the fact before the fact, right? So that's a good story I have. Um, if we could uh, move on to the next photo, uh, Nick, please. Uh, so here, uh, we are uh, celebrating our wedding. I want to point out here in this picture that there, there we are, Eduardo and I. Um, I'm holding a small uh, bottle of wine that we were given. I want to point out that a majority of these people behind us, but before one person, are all heterosexual. We made it a point to bring our heterosexual friends to our wedding and we wanted them to know. And that was, of course, a very positive decision. Uh, one of them uh, wrote in her blog that her whole perspective about marriage having nothing to do with gender uh, was confirmed and she had a great time. So we toasted. Uh, uh, Eduardo and I decided that we would use that uh, bottle of wine to raise our glasses and toast the many activists and the very courageous people who had worked for us to be able to get married on that day. We are very aware that a lot of people, many of them much younger than, than the, what, what we were at the time, worked very hard at the Mexico City Legislative Assembly to make this right a reality. So I raised uh, my glass on that day and I realized and decided that I also had to become an activist, that there was, I'm sure, something I could do to make things better for other uh, LGBTQ people. And of course, we all have our backgrounds, we all have uh, our personal stories. And uh, Nick, if we could move to the next photo, we, we, this is how the Mexico Network of Rainbow Catholics came to be. We got married in 2010, but three years before, in 2007, I founded EFETA, the first uh, LGBTIQ Catholic group in Mexico. 
So what happened then was that I just wanted to go back to my Catholic practice as I had always known it, but with people uh, that were like me. And even more important, uh, speaking the way I was, really being the person that I was. So in 2007, I did that. And as the, the time went by, um, the Rainbow uh, Network has been up for two years. Only last month, we celebrated our second anniversary. But we discovered through creating this, this network that there were a lot of people and a bunch of groups all across Mexico that wanted to do this. So, so we wanted to, to, to really make that a reality. Uh, the work is, the, the, the network is working. And uh, could we have the next photo? One of the things that we are very proud of is establishing dialogue, talking to the hierarchy, talking to the bishops, talking to the priests. I know a lot of people think this is a waste of time. We believe it makes sense. There uh, under me, uh, on that uh, screenshot, you can see the Archbishop of Monterrey. Monterrey is the third largest city of Mexico, very close to, to Texas. And it was amazing. They are starting a diversity pastoral work with that priest at the bottom uh, in Monterrey. And he was very enthusiastic and very happy to see that happening and to talk to us. And uh, let's, let's move to the last picture. Uh, this is one of my small achievements. Uh, from the U.S. government, I moved to the Mexican federal government. I became a political and media advisor to the chief of staff of the president of Mexico, our last president, Peña Nieto. So uh, painting the presidential residence in Mexico City in the rainbow colors was one of our small achievements. We did a bunch of other things that I don't have time to tell you. But I'll wrap up my story by telling you uh, a couple of things. One is I have had a chance to uh, be close to presidents, to cabinet ministers. I've talked to ambassadors. I have a picture with president-elect Joe Biden. He's a great guy. Uh, so I've been around, I've never held the positions, but I've always been, I've, I've often been around those people. And on the church's side, which has often been a force against LGBTQ rights, uh, the Catholic Church and the evangelical churches that have been growing in Mexico, they are a force to deal with, I admit that. Uh, but I've also had a chance to talk uh, and speak to cardinals and work with them and bishop conferences. And one thing that I have concluded is that all these people who, have, who are in these positions of power are just as feeble and as limited as we all are. And they just need encouragement and they need uh, to be put in a position where they can we can actually change things because what I have seen in the Catholic Church and in our government uh, and in the U.S. government is a great potential for good. I think that when they want to do that and when we press them to do certain things, I have seen them. You will not listen to hear this in the newspaper or, or in the evening news, but I have seen a church that works for the poor, that provides a spiritual uh, accompaniment as well. And I have seen my Mexican government do amazing things for people that again, you will not see in the news. The last thing I wanna say is that we need a lot of prayer. We often forget that where we recharge our batteries and where we get our real strength from is prayer. And a lot of my fellow activists, LGBTQ, when I say these are like, you're really at a loss, you're crazy. But I do believe, uh, and we have witnessed uh, the power of prayer in our activities. And of course, I invite you to, to do that as well. Thank you very much. Carlos, thank you. Your, your, your story was beautiful. And I hope one day you will be able to give me the hug in Barbados. It struck me while you were talking that I have here, I don't know whether anybody can see it. It's a picture of Peter Piers, the tenor, and Benjamin Britten, the composer. They will be with us actually on Friday. The photograph was taken in February 1947. They were lovers. So they preceded you, not formally, they preceded you by 50 odd, 60 odd years. And um, I'm very proud of you. Thank you. And your, your photograph brought tears to my eyes. That was the whole point. That was the whole point. Well, you succeeded. I was once uh, asked through my dear friend, William Dixon here, who I served under at the cathedral. Uh, he was asked whether I was gay. 
And I said, and he's, William said, no, no, he's not gay and neither am I. <laughs> I'm happily married to a Jamaican lady, uh, an attorney called Adonica, who has helped me with this thing today because I'm not very clued up. And if it hadn't been for her and for Nick in the background, I don't know where I would have been. Um, but I do believe in my very depths that we are one world and one humanity, all of us, even the Christian right. And one day, maybe we'll hug them. Yeah, just as I want to hug you now. Well, the question and answer. <laughs>